Hi, this is my bus. It's big. Powering this behemoth is a massive, lethargic diesel engine that is not up to the task of pushing a bus around. On even the slightest of grades, this thing slows down to 45 miles an hour, and that is not satisfactory. So, I'm making it electric drive. It'll still have a range extending generator. The charging infrastructure is good, but it can't handle a bus. It'll have two Tesla large drive units sitting right about here. Here they are. Who's a good drive unit? You are. God, I'm weird. Connected in tandem, sending power through the drive shaft to the existing rear differential. But there's a problem. Actually, two of them. As you may have noticed, the bus is nowhere near completion yet, which means it's not ready for a drivetrain swap yet. Or to move. And I've never done an EV conversion before. Wouldn't it be a better idea if instead of starting with an entire bus, I start out by EV converting a normal sized passenger vehicle? And I can use all of the parts that I'm going to be using in the bus in this test mule project so that when I'm done with it and I've tested it and I've had my fun with it, I can take all of the parts out of this test mule project and put them in the bus so I don't have to buy everything twice. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start out by EV converting a normal sized passenger vehicle as sort of a personal R&D project. So what would make a good test mule? Well, it needs to be four wheel drive, so I have a place for both Tesla drive units, one in the front and one in the rear. It needs to be cheap, plentiful, and have a blown engine so I don't feel bad about ripping it to pieces. And most importantly, it needs to be something I don't care about so that when I'm done with it, I don't feel bad about taking all of the good electrical bits out of it and putting them in the bus. I bought a Ford Escape and it's in mint condition. Aside from the blown head gasket and the intoxicating fumes of burning coolant. Oh, by the way, did I mention how much power a single Tesla drive unit is capable of outputting? It's 450 horsepower. And I've got two of them. I'm building a 900 horsepower Ford Escape. You know, as a learning project. You gotta start out small, you know? <laughs> well, this is a lot lighter than I thought it would be. You're idiots. You're idiots! Ooh, that doesn't look like that how that's how it's supposed to come out, but you know what? Doesn't matter! I'm throwing all this away anyway. This Escape, or Maverick as it was called in Europe, was not what I initially intended to use as my test mule. What I originally planned was the Explorer! You know, this manky thing I got for free? Sounds good. This has a live rear axle and it has a front diff powered by a drive shaft. When these drive units go into the bus, the differential in the drive unit will be welded and the output on either side will be connected to a drive shaft adapter to adapt it to a drive shaft to send power through the existing rear differential on the bus. But with that setup, the stock Tesla gearing of 9.73 to 1 is far too low. Thankfully, there's a company out there that makes replacement gearing for a Tesla large drive unit that takes it from 9.73 to 1 to 4.5 to 1, which is absolutely perfect. But it's not available and won't be until early next year. So rather than hinge my entire test mule project upon this gearing that may or may not be available in time, I decided to completely ditch the whole drive shaft adapter setup for now in the test mule and instead use the differential in the drive unit as a differential, which meant suddenly my test mule needs to have four-wheel drive, fully independent suspension all around, and enough room front and rear to mount a Tesla drive unit latitudinally between the wheels. And thus, Ford Escape. The rear differential on this thing is behind the rear suspension and all of the subframe components. There's so much space back here for a Tesla drive unit, it's like it was made for it. I might have to cut into this spare tire well, but that's nothing. And look, it's the adventure spec model with the roof rack and the, and the, oh, and the dent. See, the key to problem solving is just more extensions. I got this. I know what I'm doing. This nut won't budge, so let's use the power of induction to heat her up. <laughs> All it took is a lot of heat. <laughs> what the? What is this? Why was there just a solid chunk of metal bolted to the side of the differential? Is this something to do with NVH? This is literally a weight. You know the beauty of ripping all of this stuff that isn't going to go back in is I can just cut things that are in my way. Run away! Totally thought that was going to fall. Didn't. Very disappointed. Oh boy! 
I have no backup plan for this one. Oh boy. <clears throat> Come here. Come here, Stan. Here we go. Thank you. This is heavy, right? No, it's not that bad. Oh God. Oh God. Oh, I made a mistake. It's a differential equation. So what goes into an EV conversion? Well, I'm glad you asked. Here's a diet. That is the worst diagram I've ever seen. Motors, as I've already said, I'm using two Tesla base large drive units. I'm not using the sport units. One in the front, one in the rear. The one in the rear will be oriented behind the rear axle because that's where I have the most space. And that's actually how it was oriented in the Model S that these were used in. The one in the front, I don't know how it'll be oriented yet. Looks like it'll go in front of the axle line. There's a bunch of subframe back here in the way. If I do choose to orient it in front of the front axle, it'll be running in reverse, which is no problem because it's an electric motor. Although I think there is a unidirectional oil pump in the gearbox I'll have to change out if I do decide to run it in reverse. <laughs> heat shielding? Where we're going, we don't need heat shielding. Batteries. One third or one half of the batteries will be situated where the gas tank currently sits, and the rest will be in the engine bay. For reasons I'll talk about more in a future episode, I've decided to go with batteries out of a Chrysler Pacifica plug-in hybrid. These six modules here represent the entirety of a battery pack out of a Chrysler Pacifica plug-in hybrid. 16 kilowatt hours, 360 volts nominal. Will these six modules get me to my 900 horsepower target? No. Nowhere near it, as a matter of fact. These six modules represent one pack. I need at least three, but ideally four packs in parallel to get to that 900 horsepower target. I'm starting out with one pack because, well, quite frankly, this is all I can afford. This is a very expensive project if you hadn't already guessed. So I'm going to buy more packs and add them in parallel as I can afford them. But right now I'm starting out with one. With this one pack, I can design the battery mounts, the wiring, the cooling, and I can get the car started and rolling under its own power, albeit in power limited form. I think I can extract about 300 horsepower out of these, give or take, and about 40 miles of range. Nowhere near my targets, but it gets me started. It looks like there's a lot of stuff to disconnect on the top of the tank, which is really hard to access. But again, I don't have any intention of putting this back together, so I can just cut all this crap. Oh, there we go. That's not super heavy, but also not super light. <clears throat> oh, you guys, do you think if I remove the charcoal canister, it's going to fail its emissions test? Oh, gosh, I couldn't have that. All I've removed is the fuel system, the exhaust, and the rear diff, and something has already become exceedingly obvious. I have a ton of room under here. The Escape was the right choice. Early on, I was toying around with the idea of electrifying and 900 horsepower -ifying a Volvo wagon, and while that would have been really cool, the thing that killed that idea was the lack of space underneath it. But obviously the reason there is so much room is this is a high riding crossover. This will never be a handling champion and I'm okay with that. Charger, I'll be using it. Oh, please don't make me get it out. Fine. This is not the part I'm going for. It's just in my way. Ah. <laughs> oh yeah, urinate all over the floor. Good charger. These are the chargers I'll be using. As you just saw, I stole them for my spare Coda's butt. Each one of these is a 3.3 kilowatt charger made by Lear. Same units used in the Chevy Volt with slightly different firmware, so they're not actually interoperable. And in the Coda, there's two of them parallel together for 6.6 .6 kilowatts of charging. I'm also going to be using both of them in parallel and I'm gonna control them with the EVCC, EV charge controller from Thunderstruck Motors. Yeah, whoa. <laughs> I bumped a tire with my back. There we go. That was it. Yes, yes. Urinate everywhere gear. Oh, that's quite a long spline. Doesn't just pop out. There's a carrier bearing I need to unbolt. That's even longer spline. Look at that. DC to DC converter. With an engine, you have a belt driven alternator that provides the 14 volt to charge the 12 volt battery that runs the whole 12 volt system. In an EV, you have a DC to DC converter that steps down the pack voltage, in my case 360 volts nominal, down to 14 volts to charge the 12 volt battery to run the whole 12 volt system. This is the Delphi 2.2 kilowatt DC to DC converter I'll be using. This also came for my spare Coda's butt. High voltage goes in here, low voltage comes out here, and the whole case is the low voltage ground. 
And this does something. I'm not sure what yet. Front diff fluid. The remainder of the, ah, trans fluid. Ah, stop it. And finally, engine fluid, otherwise known as oil. I made a mess. Oh no, it is the radiator drain, but oh, it's so sludgy. Oh no. Oh, there's lots of chunks in there. Oh, what the? Oh, that's disgusting. Controls. I'm really excited about this part. I pitched this project idea to a company and said, hey, do you want to work with me? And they said, yes, that company is AEM EV, a division of Holly. They sent me a ton of really, really helpful parts like this VCU 300 vehicle control unit, the brain box that controls everything, two replacement control boards for the Tesla large drive unit, two, one for each motor, a dash display, a can keypad, and not pictured, they sent me two PDU 8s, and the whole BMS that works with this VCU. Let's not be shy about this. Without this generous contribution of parts, this project wouldn't have started. I simply wouldn't have been able to afford it. And on top of these parts, they're also giving me a goal and motivation. They've given me a deadline. Holly wants me to go to Holly High Voltage in Sonoma, California in July of next year. Do you think I'll have the escape done in time? I sure hope so. Oh my God. This is the first time that has ever happened. This gator grip thing with all the pins in it, that actually did the trick to get that bolt out. And here I thought this thing was useless and I bought it for laughs. Now the world's grossest battery tray. If this wasn't made of plastic, it would not exist anymore. Oh no, I broke it. This is throttled by cable. Surprised to see that. Oh, that's the cruise control module. Cooling system. I'm gonna have three separate liquid cooling loops in the escape. One for the front drive unit, one for the rear drive unit, and then another coolant loop for the batteries, chargers, and DC to DC converter, all of which are liquid cooled components. And they're all gonna share the same radiator in the front. I'm just gonna use the radiator that's already in the escape. It's brand new and it'll work just fine. The operating temperature of an EV's coolant is far less than the operating temperature of an engine's coolant. In an engine, the coolant is right up there next to the boiling point of water and it's kept pressurized so that it doesn't boil. In an EV, the ideal operating temperature is room temperature. So there's far less pressure on the cooling system, but that also comes with a downside because the radiator in the front can only cool things down to ambient temperature. If I'm blasting this escape through the desert or something, ambient temperature might not be cool enough. So I might want to add, and I don't know if I'll do this or not, an inline AC chiller to the cooling system to bring things down below ambient temperature. In the escape, this probably won't be necessary, but in the bus where these components are gonna be working a lot harder and generating a lot more heat, it might be necessary. I already have a high voltage air conditioning compressor. I just need everything else. And I could add a heater in line just for the batteries if I'm operating in colder climates. Again, for the escape, this probably won't be necessary, but for the bus, it would be a good idea. And I already have both of these parts. This is actually a Ford high voltage air conditioner compressor. I don't know what this was used in, but I got it out of a Coda. Wow. Oh. I find this really amusing. This is probably commonplace, but I've never seen it before. There's four heat exchangers up here. There's the AC condenser. There's the radiator for the engine. There's a small radiator down here for trans fluid cooling. And this line that goes over there and then loops back is all the cooling the power steering needs. <laughs> No fins on it, nothing. Apparently this line is all that's needed to cool the power steering fluid. This is one step away from no cooling at all. I was worried what to do with all the refrigerant and the AC system, but thankfully it's all leaked out so I didn't have to worry about it at all. <laughs> it was completely degassed. I was led to believe this radiator is new. There's a big old cut right here and it's smashed in the middle. May not be new. Oh, wow, that's beautiful. There are little sparkly bits of copper coming out of the coolant hose which is beautiful, but wh where does that come from? <laughs> engine stuff. There's currently two things in the escape that are being engine driven that I need to find a replacement for when I take the engine out. Power steering and power brakes. Power brakes is easy. It's driven by engine vacuum. So I just replace the whole engine with a small 12 volt vacuum pump and a switch. Job done. With the power steering, a common approach is to take the 
electric power steering column out of Prius and throw that in there because that goes in with minimal, minimal effort. But I'm going to try something a little bit different. I'm going to leave the hydraulic power steering rack in the Escape as is, untouched, and replace the belt-driven hydraulic pump with one that's driven by an electric motor. This is referred to as electro-hydraulic power steering, and I did a quick search on eBay and found loads of those pumps for pretty cheap, so this seems like the path of least resistance. I didn't record it, but there's a motor mount all the way on the back here, and this is what it took to remove that thing. Wobble extensions included. But I got it out, and I'm pretty sure this thing is about ready to be dropping out of here now. <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> In case you were wondering, the proper way to drop this out, if you wanted to, you know, reuse it, is to drop the whole subframe and not try to drop the engine out, but leave the subframe in place so it's catching on a few things. It's fine. I think I got it anyway. What you, what you got caught on there, buddy? Oh, it's this. Okay. Just a little wiring harness. No big deal. And then a throttle cable. No big deal. Now it's loose. <laughs> About fell over. <coughs> Oh, oh, something else is kind of hung up on it. What, what you got going on there, buddy? Oh, it's this stupid air conditioning line. It's not even connected. It just snagged. Something's hung up on it. What's hung up? What's going on? What? It's the stupid harness again. Not connected to anything. Still causing problem. Yeah. <laughs> oh, don't fall. Don't fall. Oh, stay there. Very unbalanced and teetering on the edge. <coughs> Okay, why you keep hanging up on this, you stupid disconnected line? I've been saying this thing has a blown head gasket, but I don't actually know that for sure. All I know for sure is it has an exhaust leak. We both know that because we both heard it. It has an oil leak probably all over the engine. The bottom of this thing was just shimmering with oil. The alternator is absolutely caked up with oil. It has a coolant leak. The water pump was dripping. When I drained out the radiator, Almost no actual coolant came out. I think I got a quart out of the whole system, but there was quite a bit of sludge in there. And when I took some of the coolant lines off, there were copper flakes floating in the coolant all over the place. I don't know how they got in there or what they're from. My first thought was rod bearings, but how would they get into the cooling system? And when I drained the oil out, there was no water in it, so that further confuses me. Now, while it's out here in the open, I could take this engine apart and find out what's actually wrong with it, but I'm not going to do that for two reasons. One, I'm lazy. And two, I don't want to tear this engine apart and find out that it was perfectly serviceable and I'm about to throw it away. <laughs> but why am I doing this project? Well, as you may be aware, the climate is changing and we all need to do our part to help the environment. Yeah, I'm building a 900 horsepower escape to help the environment. That'll help. Let's add another car to the road. Obviously, that's not the reason I'm doing this. I'm doing this because I want to. I mean, it's as simple as that. And I've got AEM willing to help me. Of course I'm going to take that opportunity. I am so excited about this project. If you're not already into electric cars, I don't expect this project to change your mind. You might go, oh, after watching a quiet, compact crossover from 20 years ago lay the beat down on a Dodge Hellcat, but I don't expect your mind to change. If you're already into electric cars, well, I hope this project will show you just how approachable something like this can be. Because if I can pull this off, pretty much anyone can. Right now, though, this is just the first step. I've just taken out all the engine and drivey bits. Next step is motors. That's a lie. The next video will be motors. The next actual step is to sort out the 12 volt system in here because the 12 volt positive lead that connects to the battery came out with the engine. So I know the electricals don't work in here anymore, but I'll do that off camera. See you next time.